um, man, I have missed you, and uh, I know our circumstances are much different, but I want to still spend some time in the Word of God and reach out to you and encourage you. Um, God has just been, again, you know, through the full armor of God, just been encouraging me. Uh, and that's what Scripture does. Um, faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. But I love you, and I miss you, and I wish you were here, but I know you can't be. So hopefully this can reach out to you and encourage you uh, scripturally. And so let me have a word of prayer with you, and then we're going to sing a song, and then we're going to get right into the Scripture. All right? Father in heaven, thank you for every uh, team. Uh, thank you for everyone in our church, Lord. And Father, we know that circumstances change, but as your word says, your son Jesus is the same yesterday, today, for, and forever. And Father, when our, our, our circumstances are difficult and we can't trace your hand, we're going to trust your heart. We're going to lift up our eyes into the hills from whence cometh our help. Our help cometh from the maker of heaven and earth. And Father, that's you. And Lord, we love you. We know that you keep all things together. And Father, we pray that we would take this time where as before we were busy doing a variety of things, but we would take time and focus on what really matters most in life, and that's relationships. Our relationship with you and our relationship with others. Bless us, Lord. Keep us safe. Keep us healthy. And Father, we love you, and we ask your blessing in the Word of God in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, well, I put it up here on the screen for you, uh, but it's counting every blessings. Counting every blessing. And uh, there's a lot of them. So let's sing out on this song. You might not have the uh, verses, but uh, just sing out in the chorus with me. Here we go. I was blind, now I'm seeing in color. I was dead, now I'm living forever. I had failed. the future because it's God who's in control. 
And he is sovereign. He is all-powerful over all things. So, man, are what we face, and I, I must, ch I must ch uh, tell you that our, our circumstances have changed. Um, we trust in a God who is in control over all things, and nothing takes him by surprise. Well, let me transition over here and so I can get my notes up for you today because although we haven't been meeting as a church, I still have been, you know, God has still been encouraging me in his word. And I hope that you have been spending time in God's word daily, praying and get a prayer book out, start praying and asking God uh, to really bless and to keep us safe and uh, really to speak to you through his word. And that's, he'll do that. Um, because he loves you and he cares for you. And he wants to help you understand his will. And how do you understand his will when you're spending time in his word? Well, if you take your Bibles and turn to Ephesians chapter 6, we've been talking about the full armor of God. Out of Ephesians chapter 6, verses, uh, chapter six verses 10 to 20. And as you'll see, we've been talking about Armor All. Now, I don't know if you remember, but back in the 80s, and still today, I'm sure it's a product you can use on your car, but there used to be this spray you could get with this little Viking. It was black. Uh, the label on it was the colors black, orange, and yellow, but it was this, this spray that you would spray on the interior of your car, even your tires, and what it was supposed to do was protect your interior, even your tires or whatever, from the weather, the elements, but mostly from the sun. And you would spray this stuff and it would protect your uh, leather or your pleather, whatever you have in your car, uh, from the ultra-violent uh, UV rays uh, from the sun. And you know what? So God has given us as believers in Jesus Christ this full armor of God. And so what I'd like you to do is we're going to pray, and then right after we pray, I'd like you to take a few minutes, just pause the video, and take a few minutes and um, read through Ephesians 6, verses 10 through 20, and let it be an encouragement to you. But first, let us pray. Father in heaven, give us ears to hear, heart that's understanding of your word. Father, we pray that maybe if someone's watching this that are not saved, that, that today would be the day of salvation for them. And Father, help us to realize that we're in a battle. And uh, Father, as, as soldiers of the cross... As soldiers of Jesus Christ, may we learn to tune our lives to what you would have us to, to your will. And your will is, is given in your word, Father. Thank you so much for the spirit that lives within us. Thank you for Christ and his death on the cross. And God, your tremendous love for us. And God, we pray you'll keep us safe. Keep those in our Maryland safe, Lord. Keep those in our household safe, Lord. And bless our church that we'd be able to meet uh, together again real soon. For we love you and praise you in Jesus' name. All right, go ahead and read that passage of Scripture. Okay, you should have read that passage of Scripture in Ephesians chapter 6. I'm going to catch up. I'm going to get my, my Bible on the right page. But Ephesians chapter 6, and you know what? We have been going through, bit by bit, this armor of God. And we know as we come to the book of Ephesians, it's one of four prison epistles. Um, there are several of them that Paul has written, Colossians, Philippians, Philemon, and now Ephesians. In other words, he wrote this while in incarceration, in prison. You know, you've heard the old saying, when given lemons, make lemonade. Well, that's what Paul did. While he was in prison, he didn't squander that time, but he used that time to write these epistles that now we have as treasures of faith in the Word of God, but we also understand that he was reaching out. He was sharing the gospel with the people around him. So let Paul, in his circumstances, remind us of our circumstances. That yes, even though it may be limiting, and although it may be a challenge, we still have an opportunity to reach out with the gospel, to be that salt and light. Well, as we enter this incredible epistle of Paul's, we understand that in the first three chapters, Paul really kind of begins to share the doctrine. In other words, our relationship with Jesus Christ, the foundation of our relationship with Jesus Christ. And you know what? I mentioned the word doctrine, but don't let that word scare you. You know, theology, doctrine, ah, ah, ah. relax, it's going to be okay. 
It's just a foundational truths that we as believers in Jesus Christ build our lives off of. Uh, we got to be careful that we don't build our lives off of what is popular or that we don't build our lives out of what our feelings. Uh, I just feel, well, that's not proper. We have to build our foundation, our relationship with God through his word. That's really where we understand God. And that's what really helps our relationship to grow. And we start off with milk, the simple gospel truth that we receive. And then we move on to, to bread. And then you get a little deeper and you move on to the fish. And then you go and you get the meat of the word of God. That's when you get into the deeper things. And we need to progress in our knowledge of God. Isn't that what Peter said? That we would grow in the grace and knowledge of who God is. And that happens when we open up our Bibles and begin to read and see the great treasures God has as he reveals his will for our lives. You know, we're creating the image of God. Some out there would say you're just a random occurrence. But you know what? You're creating the image of God, and God's got purpose, and he loves you so much. How do I know he loves you? Duh. By what he sent for you. He sent his only begotten son to die on Calvary for you and for me. That's a lot of love. So as we look at this, we see, understand the first three chapters are about doctrine. But then we transition in chapter 4, and we see in chapter 4, Paul says this, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherein you are called. That you would walk worthy. My friend, as a believer in Jesus Christ, how's your walk? You're like, well, you know, I overpronate on my inside foot. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about your walk before God. And not, not necessarily, I'm not talking about what other people know about you. That's just a reputation. I'm talking about what God knows about you. You know what, uh, as I look in the Old Testament, I see Solomon, especially as he wrote the book of Ecclesiastes. What a sad story that was. Because although he knew God, he didn't honor God with the way he lived. And I believe he wasn't a happy man, but he was a haunted man. He was haunted by the squandered time. And Paul says to Timothy, be an example in your youth. This is not time to, to give up and just, oh, it's too hard, as one kid said in my class one time. No, hey, oh, it's not too hard. It's a privilege. It's an honor to live for God. And Paul says that in the beginning. Now he's transitioning from doctrine in chapters 1 to 3 to duty. What is your, yes, sir, duty? And I'm not talking about something you have to do, although maturity is doing sometimes some things you may not feel like doing. You know, we're so led by our feelings. There's nothing wrong with that. But when our feelings take us contrary to the Word of God, that is a problem. That is a problem. And then we've got to look deeper. Is it our heart? You know, Paul, John said it best when he was in the wilderness, preparing people for Jesus. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Maybe you and I need to look a little deeper than what is at surface. And we need to repent and in chapters 4 through 6, we see Paul hammering this idea home of duty. How do you live before the world? Oh, oh no, he's going to talk about he, he's going to talk about legalism. Oh, relax. But I will say this, that if you are saved, then guess what? You are sanctified. You are set apart. Not to say, I'm better than everybody else, because you're not. You're saved. You called out from among them to be separate. Act like it. And it's not for salvation. It's because of salvation. It's because, man, I love you, God. Isn't that what Joseph said? I can't sleep with you, Potiphar's wife. Because I love God so much. It wasn't that he hated everybody. It's just that he did not want to offend God. Because he loved God so much. You know, I think that's what we could use in this world. A little bit more love for God. And a little bit less love for ourselves. Oh, sign me up. I know I need that. I'm working like this all the time. But I'm thankful for a God that even when I'm faithless, He is faithful. And He's got a perfect faithfulness in me. So we get to chapter 6, and it says in the beginning of chapter 6, 
Children, obey your parents and Lord, but this is right. It also talks to dads, and it says, or it goes on with the children, it says, Honor thy father and mother, which is thy first commandment, with a promise, that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth. And ye fathers, provoke not your children. So he's beginning about talking about the social dynamic of a family. And then he goes on and says about servants in chapter 5. And then we get down to verse 10, and it says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. You know, that's why uh, a stance for the Lord is always your uh, one foot in front of the other. You always want to put Jesus out in front. You, you, you don't stand uh, uh, um, uh, with your legs shoulder width apart, your feet shoulder width apart. You don't do that. You put one foot in front of the other because Jesus is always first. And let me remind you, you are second. I am second. I must what? Decrease? He must increase. So get the proper stance before you're getting out in the battle. And this is a physical reminder of a spiritual truth. He's number one, you're number two, okay? You're second, and that's always how it's going to be in life. Make him number one. Be strong in who he is, not who you are, because your, your strength is failing. It's evaporating. It's going. So as we go on and we see this strength, we also know that our enemy is out there. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness, and this uh, of rulers of darkness in this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. You know what? You've got a foe. Don't forget it, my friend. You've got a foe, and that foe is the flesh, and that foe is the world and its system and its thinking. Obey your thirst. No. And then the final threat is that satanic attack. Satan and his demons. And you and I have to be aware of this threat. Don't you love it the first time someone goes laser tagging? They love it. They're in their little arena and they're doo 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 and they're shooting around. But then you see that person that goes paintballing for the first time. I love it. They get out in that paintball field and they're like, you know, I'm going to stand up in front of everybody. And they, and, and man, you're just like so excited when that type of person comes out there because you're like, man, free target practice. And you pop, 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 pop. And you, with a paintball gun, pop, pop, pop. And they're like, oh, oh. They do the hit jiggle. Oh, 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 and that hurts. And you're like, well, duh. What you think? It's paintball. I'm not laser tag. What are you doing? And you know, the next time they come in, they're like on the ground and they're like, moving like inches. You're like, what's wrong? And they're like, it hurts. And you're like, yeah. Listen, as a Christian, you and I cannot deny that there's an enemy out there that wants, and by the way, the Word of God declares it. Satan is like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Oh, my friend. That's why we've got to be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. And just to show this, God has given us different pieces of armor to put on every day. And we started talking about these. We talked about the belt of truth. That keeps everything connected. Take all the loose thoughts in your life and connect them to the belt. You have the feet shod with the preparation. Shod means secure. Your stance is so important in the world in which you live in. Be ready to give the gospel out. Always be ready to give an answer of the hope that lies within you. And then we have the breastplate of righteousness, protecting the heart. Man, we've got to keep that heart clean. We've got to keep it pure. And then we have the shield of faith. Man, we got a duck behind that. You know, the shield of faith is not these ornate little shields that maybe knights would carry, but these were huge, three foot, maybe four foot high shields that were connected that you would hide behind when the archer's flaming arrows would come towards you. You hide behind that. Well, as we look at today, we've got the helmet of salvation. The helmet of salvation. And this helmet is unreal, it's beautiful. And it shows us a couple of things. The helmet of salvation is, first of all, it's for protection. But then it also reminds us of the power. And what do I mean by protection? Well, this piece needs to be sought after and needs to be put on the head. Vital defensive piece as the war wages on, not just in the opening game or the middle game or the end game, but the entire game. Game, and I, and I really shouldn't use that word game, but I'm talking about the battle, the conflict. Listen, Satan knows he's lost the war. He knows he's lost the war. If you're saved, you are kept by the power of God. No one can ever take that salvation from you. But I will say this, Satan is now 
trying to rob you of the blessings. He's trying to defeat you. He's trying to discourage you. Oh, you brought into that line. Hey, get saved and everything's going to be great. You'll never have another problem again. Listen, that may work at Disney World. <laughs> Disney World. I don't know why I mentioned that. But that may work there, but it's not a reality in the real person's life. It's not a matter of if, but when you're going to face difficulty. And Paul is saying right here, he's saying, hey, you've got to have this helmet of salvation on. And it's, it's protecting, what is it protecting? It's protecting you from vital blows. We'll get to that in a minute. But have you ever played a sport and you were given all this equipment? You may not notice by looking at me, but it was one time I used to play football. And I remember that I was given the shoulder pads, I was given uh, um, hip pads, I was given, you know, also knee pads and my cleats and uh, uh, thigh pads, and I even had forearm pads and helmet uh, and elbow pads, okay? I, I was decked out. I, I looked like a, a knight of pads. And for important reason, I mean, look at my size. I was small back then, playing these huge football players. But the most important part of the entire equipment that I had was my helmet. There were two types of helmet. There was a riddle that had sponges and it compressed when, when, when it was hit. And then there was another one inside the helmet that was like water chambers. And you'd hit that. I mean, I remember just playing with that, squishing that water through that. But the reason a helmet was needed because of the violent collisions that occurred. Jamal Lewis, uh, a running back several years ago for the Baltimore Ravens, he said when he was in high school, he would get hit once a season very violently. We called it in football getting your bell rung. I mean, you just get up and you're like, what's going on? I'll take out the trash tomorrow, Mom. You didn't know what was going on. And then later on, he expressed in college, he would get hit once a game very violently to where he was getting his bell rung. But in the NFL, he said, he got his bell rung every single play of every game. I mean, it is a violent sport of collision. There is no way anybody playing football saying, I don't need my helmet. But haven't you and I done that? You see, the armor works best when it's working all together, when it's put all on. And we need to remember that as we face a conflict. But but the soldier would put on this helmet of salvation, and there was a reason, because the enemy, many of the infantry, would have something called long swords. And these long swords were about maybe two to three feet long. They're not like the gladius that the Roman soldiers were using, which were a little shorter. But these were long swords, and two to three feet long, and they were double-handed swords. And the whole idea of these swords was to come at the enemy and to, by the way, they were double-edged, come at the enemy and swing at the enemy. And they were trying to do two things, either knock them out or knock their head off. Now, I don't want to be violent, but to say that the enemy of God, Satan and his principalities and his demons, doesn't want to knock you out is ridiculous. Don't, don't line up for your opponent to attack you. And please don't ever say, I can handle it. That's a, that's a lie from the bottomless pits of hell. I can handle it. Because you know what? No, you can't. There's only any way that we can handle anything in life, and that's through the power of God. So away with this notion that I can handle it. Because the Bible says, pride cometh before a fall. And greater men than I, greater men than you, greater men than we've ever known have fallen. So let's remember that. Let's keep humble, let's keep hungry, but let's keep the helmet on the head. Because even though we're not in a physical battle, we are in a spiritual battle. And the long sword that Satan is swinging around today is double-edged. And here's the double edge: Doubt and discouragement. Doubt and discouragement. Do you remember King David? King David asked this question, Why so downcast, O oh my soul? I love what he says. He goes on, though. He's intentional. He's not just going, oh, why is it I'm so sad? <laughs> Come on, man. He's intentional. Put your trust in God. I even think about Elijah. After defeating the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel, what a great victory, ran in fear and discouragement from Jezebel's threat to the point to where he's by a brook and he says, God, just, I, I'm done. I end me. Even Jonah, who went from the prodigal prophet 
to the praying prophet. All the way at the bottom of the sea. To the preaching prophet. You notice God's always saying to Jonah, arise, arise, arise. <laughs> and then finally, the pouting prophet. And we see these individuals in the Bible. Not, that's why I love the Bible. It's not sugar-coated. We see them at their triumphs. We see them at their tragedies. And even at their, their worst point, God was still faithful. God was still encouraging them. God was still egging them to go on. Goading them, if you will. Go on. Keep going. That's what I love about a God that we serve. You see, we're soldiers of the cross. And we should expect difficulties in this life. Soldiers will tell you that the scars will come. Some just show on the outside. And some show or don't show that are on the inside. As a soldier of cross, we should put on the helmet of salvation and never take it off. Until Christ removes it and replaces it with a crown. Here's what Peter says in 1 Peter 1, 13, Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So how can you guard against being discouraged and doubtful in the battle you're called to stand? Well, let me just give you some practical things. Some practical things. And number one, um, how's your sleep and diet? How's your sleep and diet? Are you getting enough sleep? Are you getting the right food? Uh, you're like, wow, uh, you really started out with that? That's not very spiritual. No, it, it, and you're right, it may not be very spiritual, but I will say this, your body's the temple of the Holy Spirit, and we need to take care of the temple. Are you sleeping enough? Are you eating well? I'm diabetic, and, and my, my diet really affects me. And I need to be very cautious about what I eat, how I eat, and what I eat, because it affects me. Now, that's not to say that's the only thing, but there are a couple of other things. First of all, and second of all, repent. Repent of what? Repent of your sin. If we say we have no sin, we're, we're a liar, and we make God a liar. But I'm thankful that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Repent. Also, know what is going on. Know what's going on. 2 Timothy 3.1 says, that in the last days, perilous times shall come. Be, be aware, but don't dwell. Be aware, but don't focus. In other words, uh, I've come in contact with some people that have been watching a lot about what is happening in society today. And I'm not going to mention it just because everybody else is and they don't, you don't need to hear that. But, and, and they get so fixated on it that it becomes overwhelming to them in their spirit. Be careful you don't over, uh, become overwhelmed. Go to the headquarters. Go to church. If you can't go to church, get some good online material. Obviously, you're watching this. Praise the Lord. Practice praise and prayer on a daily basis. Verbalize. I praise the Lord for this. Surround yourself with some good Christian music. And then finally, laugh out loud. Man, just laugh out loud. Watch something that's funny. Why are you always watching? You're just so down all the time. Watch out for also toxic people that are constantly discouraging you. Um, they're constantly getting you down. Now, I'm not talking about they're telling you the truth. Truth is beautiful. Truth is great. But I'm just telling everything is half full, man. It's, oh, it's chicken. Little sky is falling. You've got to be careful of that. These are things that will help to be protective in a very practical way. Salvation is the key. And my friend, if you are not saved, let me invite you to taste and see that the Lord is good. But you've got to realize you're a sinner. You're not only a sinner. You're a filthy, no-good, maggot sinner. That's me. Ooh. That's me. Get a hot, get God's view of sin. And that you are, you are sinful. I'm sinful. That's why we need a Savior. Oh, my friend, would you treat receive Christ? You're like, I'm not, I'm perfect. Okay, I can tell people that I'm perfect, and you know what? I think I am pretty good looking. But all you need to do is ask my wife and my family and those that know me best, and they say, Oh, I remember when you did this. Because no one is perfect. We're all sinful. That's why we need a Savior. Because he's the only one that can save us from our sins. Because he was perfect and died on the cross at Calvary. 
And when he said it was finished, it was finished. Your sin and my sin was finished. And the power of this, as we go on, we see the power of what it brings. It brings hope. You see, when you're on the battlefield, you're getting, you're getting hammered. And salvation brings hope because there's no other name given among men whereby ye must be saved. Do you remember the Philippian jailer? Paul, Paul, what must I do to be saved? He said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And where's Jesus right now? Jesus at the right hand of the throne of God in a position of authority and he's sitting down. Why? Because his sacrifice, unlike the temple and the offering of the sacrifice of the lambs, and his sacrifice was sufficient. And man, I want to tell you something. Hearing and looking forward to that day, that's why salvation brings hope on the battlefield of life. Because when you have the helmet, you're constantly reminding you that one day I'm going to step into the presence of an almighty God. Listen to what William Grunnell said. He said, the Christian is not beneath hope as long as he's above ground, nor above hope as long as he is beneath heaven. Once the soldier enters heaven, he can say, armor was for earth. But robes are for heaven. Robes are for heaven. Salvation is a beautiful, powerful thing. And my friend, let me tell you something. Let me also encourage you. The helmet was used to identify. The soldiers that wore those helmets, oftentimes, they would identify. They would have plumes or they would have things or ornate decorations on that to identify them to the general and the commander. Let me encourage you as we wind this up. Oh, my friend, identify with Christ. Identify with him. That's who you let mold your life. Not some social issue out there. Not some group of friends. Not something in the world. Don't let that identify you. Don't let a piece of clothing or a skateboard or, or uh, a haircut or, or anything identify you. In other words, Christ is who you want to please. And how do you know what Christ is pleased with? When you read his love letter, when you read the word of God. The helmet of salvation is protective, but it's also powerful. Because it's based in who Jesus Christ is. He's the same yesterday, today, forever. Be strong in the Lord, and then the power, the dunamis of his might. And he is powerful. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I thank you for this wonderful time together. I pray that you will bless. And uh, I pray that some words that I've said, Lord, even as we come to the word of God, some words that were said would have been an encouragement to the, to the young people. We love you and we, we thank you. And pray if there's anyone out there that's not saved, that today would be the day of salvation with them. That they would say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner, and save me for Christ's sake. And God, you will in no ways turn them out. You will in no ways put them out. But you will accept them. Father, thank you for your love. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your sacrifice. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a good week.